Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Trade Policy Research Forum uh, February 2024 webinar. Um, we're going to be talking about multidimensional trade policy and multidimensional research and looking in particular at the issue of fisheries. Um, we've got two great presenters. Uh, Hannah will say a little more about them in a moment. Christine McDaniel from George Mason and Sarah Stewart from uh, Silverado. But uh, while people are just coming into the room, I'm going to take the opportunity to introduce the Trade Policy Research Forum and just say a couple of words about what we do. Uh, my name is Ben Shepherd. I started the forum with my partner in crime, Hannah Norberg, who's also here uh, during the pandemic, uh, so about three and a half years ago. Um, our aim is to do approximately monthly webinars focusing on a policy relevant research topic um, in the trade space. We try to build bridges, as you can tell from the logo. Uh, there's a bridge between research and policy, between research and practice, and among the different parts of the trade policy community. So we've had lawyers, we've had political scientists, uh, Hannah and I are both economists, so we do unfortunately have a bias towards economists. Um, and of course, we have policy professionals uh, talking as well. So the idea is that if you're working in trade policy, uh, particularly today, then people in all of these areas need to learn how to speak to each other and they need to learn how to be up to date on uh, the different pieces of research that are going on. Everything we do has a policy focus. Um, so we liken our sessions to a, uh, a lunchtime seminar that you might be familiar with from uh, graduate school, but with a twist, well, two twists. One twist is that we're nice. Um, so we behave decently yeah. to people. Um, and we keep the questions uh, focused and polite at all times. And uh, then the second thing that's different is that we like to have more of a discussion and a moderated Q&A. Um, so once we start the session proper, you'll see that there's a chat box and a Q&A box. Um, participants are more than welcome to put their questions and comments into those two areas. And Hannah and I will get them uh, back in front of the speakers uh, during the Q&A session. Um, there's a couple of ways that you can uh, stay up to date on what's going on with the Trade Policy Research Forum. One is to join our group on LinkedIn. Uh, we have about 3,000 members. It's a great place. If you have a, a new paper or a new policy brief, it's a great place to post it and uh, get some thoughts and comments. Um, you can also join up uh, for our mailing list. You'll get a mailing from Zoom uh, tomorrow, uh, tomorrow morning, uh, a day after the webinar, with a link to sign up for our mailing list. And that way you're always up to date uh, with what we've got uh, going on. So uh, that's all I wanted to say about the forum. Let me hand over to uh, Hannah to introduce today's session. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ben. And thank you, everybody who is here. I see some very good friends in the audience today. Uh, and uh, we have one of our advisors here, Barbara's here, and Garrett's here, and a lot of people that we know are here. It's so good to see you, everybody. Hey, Simon. Um, and, and before we start, I should also let everybody know that this is all done on a volunteer basis. So as always, we should say thank you to Rob Yul, who does all our uh, posters coming out of Bangladesh. Um, and so before, so uh, without further ado, I will jump on, and I am super, super, super psyched about this session. Uh, we always have great sessions, um, but this one is particularly interesting to me. First of all, because MC is coming up um, next week and fisheries is one of the uh, important issues that are coming up there. Uh, and so, but also uh, because as trade policy is getting so intricate. So, I mean, I remember 10 years ago when we start, started talking about non-tariff barriers. Before that, it was all about tariffs. But now Tara, everything uh, is, the kitchen sink is actually thrown at trade policy. And at the same time, trade policy is also the fault of everything else. Uh, and so we really, really, really have to kick off uh, the, the conversations to a brand new level. And it's hard to do. And that's why I'm so thrilled that Christine McDaniel, my friend and my colleague, uh, both Christine and Sarah are my friends, colleagues, and also idols. I should let, uh, you know, full disclosure, I should let everybody know that. Um, uh, that she took that upon herself. She's like, this is a really important issue and we need to look at it dif differently. So the last year she took this upon herself and she just dove in and she's like, we need people coming in from all sorts of issues, right? So she'll tell us all about that. Um, so that is really, really, really important. Then we got to pair her up with Sarah. 
And so Sarah was not, so she used to be um, in charge of these negotiations for USCR, uh, for USMCA and for TPP and resentability too. So she knows exactly how these policies are made and you know how that sausage is made. Uh, and then she uh, no longer works for the USCR, but she works for Silverado, uh, which is a policy accelerator, which is a new type of institution uh, where they, it's not a think tank per se, so they don't sit around and think, but they look at policies and then they, as it says in the name, accelerate them. So not only is this a timely issue, not only is it an important issue, but we also have these amazing speakers who are taking on trade policy in a brand new way. And so that's why I'm so excited to be here today. So I'm gonna leave it at that. Please do look them up though on LinkedIn uh, and check out their awesome profiles there. And uh, they're also open to, I checked, they're also open to continuing the conversations that we might have because we always run out of time, right? Uh, there too. So without further ado, I think I will leave it over to Christine to kick us off. Um, by by introducing all of this. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Also, people, why don't you hop into the chat box and let us know where you're coming in from today? Because then you know where the chat box is when the uh, your inspiration for questions come in. And we also get to know more about you. Go ahead, Christine, for real this time. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for joining. Um, I, um, I haven't seen who's in the audience yet because I would be like, oh, I want to say hi. So, um, but I'll be excited to um, check that out in a sec. Uh, and it is so exciting to be here with Sarah Stewart um, and um, especially, and Ben and Hannah, thank you so much for hosting this. You know, we are all about bridging the gap. My whole life has been about bridging the gap between um, research and policy or, or re research policy and policy makers. Uh, Mercatus is, you know, all about uh, bridging that gap too between your know, academic work to the policy world. So um, this is very, uh, you know, natural uh, place for me to be. And I had a laugh when you said about, you know, it used to be non-tariff barriers. I remember in like 2002, three-ish, four-ish maybe, um, you know, talking about trying to get people in, you know, at Commerce uh, and USTR to, um, to pay more attention to non-tariff barriers. Then, you know, when I was at CA trying to get everyone to pay more attention to services. Um, and now it's really more about, you know, just kind of a whole different approach because these trade issues, like you were saying, Hannah, uh, you know, and as I'm, and I'm sure Ben and Sarah know it quite well, it's just increasingly complex. And that just means um, we just need, you know, different approaches. And so this is sort of a kind of get out of your comfort zone for most trade economists. But that's one thing that um, when we teamed up with the University of Pittsburgh last year, you know, we really wanted to, uh, we, we realized we needed to take a multidisciplinary approach to this. And so we, um, we basically uh, got people from all over the country, all over the world, uh, different, different disciplines uh, to, um, to do not just a plain conference or uh, a panel, but to actually do this, what they call a co-creation event, where we literally had people, um, we had you know, to stand up all day, walk around, to, we had three different tables, we had a workshop in Pittsburgh, um, at the university there, and we uh, talked about global, uh, well, innovative solutions to global overfishing. So I'm gonna take you through uh, some of those key findings and you really, I mean, I've, done, I've written a lot on this, um, but I mean, th this is really, I'm really just standing on the shoulders of these amazing researchers that we brought together uh, in the workshop and <clears throat> the, um, and, and, uh, and they're all cited and um, on our, on our website uh, for, and all their work, they all wrote issue briefs right before the uh, workshop and they revised them afterwards. Uh, and so what this is really about, you know, is how to make the WTO agreement on fisheries effective, right? Because, you know, it's one thing to have an agreement on paper that, you know, the 2022 agreement was indeed uh, a landmark, but it, it's, you know, necessary, but not sufficient. And so we really need the further and broader rules and disciplines that will be on the table Later this month in Abu Dhabi, we need you know two thirds of members to sign onto those, 
and then that and then that's where the magic needs to happen after that point is going to be an implementation <clears throat> and implementation is really where this research is all about so what we have here is one issue is um i want to talk about is like a lot of people think that this agreement is really just about uh, global overfishing <clears throat> but it's really about it's not really about that for trade economists like this is really more about solving these increasingly complex trade issues, right? That we're gonna be facing. <clears throat> and it's it gets really more into the global commons area. Um, and so I'm gonna talk about how, um, and then I'll bring this back at the end too, how we really need more research on access agreements. And I'll talk about a little bit about that, both descriptive and empirical. We need more research on monitoring techniques and um, you know different types of monitor monitoring techniques and effects on fish stocks. Again, both have got me out of my comfort zone on this project over the past year, working with um, these, they call themselves like polycentric social scientists. I'm um, like, what's that? Um, but well, I'll talk a little bit about that too, because we have a lot of global commons problems coming into our future, you know, not just overfishing, but also space junk. Um, and there's so, so many other things that I know a lot of people in the audience um, uh, might be thinking about as well. Um, so. A little bit about this workshop, you know, we mobilized scholars uh, and we had them write issue briefs. And then after the, the co-creation event, we had them go back and revise it. They're all on our website now. Uh, but, you know, we really, we, we asked them to, to present innovative solutions to global overfishing, you know, focusing on implementation for the WTO agreement. Uh, and, and if you put all of their issue briefs on top of each other, kind of, um, you know, like there, there's some common, common uh, strong themes that come out. One is we need a focus on bottom up solutions. Most of trade agreements, uh, standard trade agreements are pretty much done at the capital, right? You know, tra you know, change this tariff, um, change this non-tariff barrier um, regulation or something. Uh, but for this agreement to be implemented effectively, it's going to take more of a community you know, bottom up solution focused. Uh, approach. Also, leveraging existing international agreements. Again, in our traditional trade agreements, you don't really need to leverage many other things. But for this one, um, we've got a lot of other, uh, we worked with uh, different international lawyers and really uh, realized the need to, to look for, for WTO members to leverage other international um, existing agreements. And then lastly, one thing that really became clear to me was just the need for swift implementation. Um, there is, a, especially for developing countries, uh, and technical assistance in terms of helping them um, get um, up with um, facilitating, like you know, innovative uh, ways to to monitor and enforce, you know, monitor the fish stocks uh, and be able to be transparent with other international organizations. Um, and that <clears throat> doesn't always need to be, uh, you know, very expensive high-tech uh, methods. Some, some uh, communities and coastal communities have been able to do this with fairly low-tech methods, but it, uh, the one thing they need is, you know, the, the ground up agreement on, on the need to do it. And then you, you do tend to get uh, much more effective monitoring there. So <clears throat> one thing um, that, the this, uh, question that we've seen a lot is, you know, how, what are the numbers on this? And there's a lot of different numbers being bandied about. And I have noticed people get a little touchy about this, but, but I, um, I keep coming back to the um, FAO data on this and the, uh, and, and this top part here on fish stocks, you know, you, you can see how, uh, there's 60% of, of fish stocks are maximally fished and 34% are overfished. So what does this mean? Well, overfished means that, you know, the catch has been too high and it's, it's, it's leading, it's already leading to a decline in that stock. But maximally fished means that, that catching the fish, the most fish possible without causing fish stocks to decline. In other words, if there's any increase in in the fishing activity, then you're going to get into overfished. So technically speaking, over 90% of our fish stocks are either depleted or near depletion. Okay, so um, 
you know, this is fairly dire. Um, and, um, and people will, some people will say, well, you know, only a third are overfished. Well, that's true. But the thing about maxly, maximally fished is that once it's, it's already, once um, overfishing is already happening, right? Um, even if overfished is not, is not uh, realized, even if once overfishing is happening and you're at maximally fished point, it's often too late. Uh, <clears throat> some people might remember here the, uh, the Pollock fishery of the central Bering Sea. Uh, well, today, you know, that would be the, one of the largest fisheries in the world if it still existed. But overfishing, um, once overfishing finally was declared and a mor moratorium was finally declared in the 1990s, um, it was unable to recover. So a lot of times, uh, you know, what we see is that once you wait until overfishing um, to, to declare a moratorium or just to change techniques, it's often too late. Uh, people fishing around here, you know, in the Chesapeake Bay will tell you, you can read about it. Um, the, um, so, so it's, it's a really, and that's one thing I really learned about this working with Bradley Sewell, and we have a piece on this, um, and Bradley Sewell was, um, well, he was with Coast Guard and Interpol, and um, his whole life has been dedicated to this, and, and he really explained to me how, why it's so important to um, also include overfishing and not just overfished uh, in, in, uh, in the wording of these agreements. Uh, there's a picture of a fish. I thought, you know, we have to kind of keep it, keep it kind of fun. So um, being at Mercatus, you know, Mercatus is Latin for market. Uh, and a lot of my colleagues here are uh, work on uh, global commons problems. Nobel laureate Eleanor Ostrom, um, who uh, my colleague uh, Eileen Norcross, uh, her, a lot of her work is focused on Ostrom's work. She, and she's taken it and applied it in the fascinating ways. But you know what we're uh, seeing is that Ostrom Ostrom had um, a lot of work focused on you know implementing solutions to tragedy of the commons, but there it, there isn't as much application of her work on the global scale, right? So it's one thing to you know have overfit have overfishing in a lake and have people you know in that community get together and um, and apply these techniques to to solve tra to solve the commons problems. But it's a whole other thing when those people, you know, around the world and, and come from different sovereign governments, right? And may or may not uh, be cooperating. So this is a brand new area, really, I think for, for um, economics, especially international economics, you know, how to apply successful um, Ostromian techniques to global commons problems. And, uh, and, I, and I think this is gonna be a real uh, interesting issue for further research moving forward. This is a picture of, of Ostrom in, in the late 60s. So, you know, the tragedy of the commons, you know, for those of you who kind of want to remember, oh yeah, what was that again? Well, it's basically, it's this is about, um, you know, nobody owns it, but everybody owns it, right? So you think you can think of, um, you can think of water, for instance, right? Water belongs to no one, but it belongs to everyone, right? So uh, Rashid Somalia, a very internationally renowned, uh, quite well-known scholar who also participated in the conference, you know, I like the way he said it. He said, well, you know, if I, if I catch it, then it's mine. But if you catch it, then it's yours. And, you know, there's no, there's no particular property right on it. Uh, so it's really first come, first serve. So obviously it's in everyone's individual interest to go and catch the fish. So by acting in everyone, by everyone acting in their individual interest, you know, it just leads to overfishing and then overfished. And it's, uh, so it's, Surely it's you know pr pretty inevitable this is going to happen, um, and hence the need for global cooperation. And we're not just talking about you know uh, recreational fishing on the weekends or anything. I mean we are talking about uh, pretty major industrial boats that have been getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and uh, and this doesn't this picture doesn't even do it justice. But getting bigger and bigger and bigger and literally scraping the bottom of the seas to the point where you know, you're, they're not only catching the fish that they mean to catch, but they're catching everything else. And then by the time they pull it up, you know, it's, you know, it is destroyed. So we're literally scraping the bottom of our seas. Uh, and, um, 
and as as Enrique Sala of the National Geographic said, you know, it's really the, the ocean is really the last natural hunting ground uh, on on the planet. So <clears throat> the um, this is a nice uh, piece here uh, uh, by a, a, in a piece by Rashid Somalia and his uh, colleagues, where we uh, look at the where they look at the top subsidizing nations and or political entities uh, in 2018 by by type of subsidy. Okay, so we have, it, you know, so not all subsidies are created equal, right? Some subsidies go to fuel. Some subsidies go to, um, well, just building gigantic fishing vessels, um, you know, with industrial bottom trawlers. And other subsidies go to, um, you know, conservation and monitoring techniques or, uh, or subsidizing fishing activities um, that can, you know, that, that are done in accordance with, um, you know, concert, uh, sustainable fishing techniques. So we can see by by this graph that there's a lot of variation across the uh, subsidy types, and we can also see who the um, biggest subsidizers are. I mean, it's China, the uh, European Union or European countries, uh, United States, Korea, Japan, etc. But they do different types of subsidies. So while China is really more folk, uh, their, their subsidies really go more toward the capacity enhancing uh, activities, which do lead to illegal, unreported, unregulated uh, fishing activities uh, that, that are associated with the overfishing and overfished uh, results. The, uh, the EU, uh, the US, they, they tend to be more uh, concentrated in more of the conservation um, related ones. But, you know, but everyone you can see, though, I mean, there are not very many uh, completely innocent players here. So, I mean, every uh, no, no one's not no one's uh, completely clean here. And um, and everyone is going to have to, you know, um, commit to to um, to changing the way they they uh they dole out the their taxpayers' funds. Um, and then also another thing that Somalia and his colleagues did is they looked at the fishing uh, fishery subsidies uh, amount by category and type in terms of developed and developing. And we can see here that again, a lot of heterogeneity right across across these different types. And we can also see that the uh, developing countries, Tend to be more heavily on, um, you know, fuel subsidies, uh, fish, and, and, and tax exemption, uh, marketing and storage infrastructure, etc. While developed countries tend to be more into fisheries management um, and uh, marine uh, and the MPA uh, areas, marine protected areas, uh, and so on. But you know, this is just looking at <clears throat> the um, developing versus developed, and it's. You don't want to draw too many generalized conclusions from this. Um, I, I do want to talk a little bit about India. We had a, a really great piece in the uh, in our issues brief series by these two Indian economists, uh, Krishnan and uh, Badri Narayanam, and they talk a, a detail and demonstrate how India has been a really victim of these large foreign subsidized vessels coming into or around their economic exclusive zones, their, their waters, um, and, um, and you know, leaving very little fi uh, fish for, for the locals to catch. And for developing countries, especially, co you know, coastal communities that rely on the fishing industry, this can be quite devastating. You know, so India, um, you know, according to this paper and um, and other research, but particularly this paper, because it paper is so well done. I mean, it's quite clear how India has so much to gain from swift implementation of the WTO agreement. Uh, and <clears throat> and yes, you know, sure, they can definitely be, um, benefit from uh, working with other countries on monitoring techniques and et cetera. But. India itself has so much to gain from immediate implementation of this agreement, which is uh, why, you know, when so many of us are perplexed as to um, why they would want to uh, to um, to delay it or or 
you know, why they're asking for a 25 year implementation period, uh, because, you know, once their own um, stocks are gone within their EEZs, um, they'll either have to, you know, rely on others, uh, while their whole fishing fisheries industry will be wiped out, um, or they'll have to subsidize to do more fishing on the high seas, which um, they claim that they do very little of right now. So, um, so that's one thing I'd love to, to get Sarah's thoughts on as well. Uh, so in terms of directions for further research, I think we need more research on access agreements. Andrew Johnson has a, done a lifetime work on access agreements, which are these agreements that countries, coastal nations, uh, governments will sign with other countries or other fishing vessel companies on, you know, here are the terms uh, on which you can come in and fish our waters. And that might sound like a good deal because a lot of these developing countries don't have, you know, they just don't have the scale or scope economies to do a great job. Uh, and they can get monies from the more advanced fishers uh, and those monies can be allocated, you know, accordingly. On paper, yes, that sounds great. But in practice, as Johnson explores, that uh, more often than not does not happen. What happens is that the terms of these access agreements are not transparent. The monies tend to end up in the hands of a very few um, officials and the um, and, and sometimes a lot of under the table money uh, as well. And the overfishing happens and the monies do not end up in the hands of the citizens while the citizens of these coastal nations then are left with one, not even any money from the access agreements, and two, um, overfished um, waters. So there is, I mean, it's a total lose-lose situation for the citizens of these developing countries. So access agreements, um, you know, are, we really need more work understanding these access agreements and, and pushing for transparency on them. We also need more work on different monitoring techniques. And then, like I said, uh, more research on bottom-up implementation for uh, global agreements and global commons problems. And for that, I think I will leave it there and hand it over to, um, to, um, to Sarah. Thank you so much, Christine. And thank you, of course, Hannah and Ben for putting this together. I mean, this is a, an extremely timely topic. Um, many of us have been uh, working on these issues for uh, several decades now, but finally in the last few years, we're starting to see actual, you know, movement and consensus. So I think that is really, really exciting. Um, Christine, I think the research that you are doing with your team is so invaluable. Um, and I hope that you continue it. And I hope that you know, your sort of uh, call to action doesn't fall on deaf ears because it really is through the the data-driven research process that we're going to be able to move this, this forward. So I wanted to offer some further perspectives on the interdisciplinary approach, just based on my own experience, and then um, put out some thoughts on kind of where we're headed from a policy perspective um, with all of that um, great research, you know, as a as a foundation. Um, so, you know, what's interesting in thinking about this global commons fisheries issue and how we approach it is that it's really not unique to fisheries. Um, this is, you know, for all environmental issues, and I think we're going to see this more and more with trade and climate as well. Um, you have to take an interdisciplinary approach. You have to bring all of the experts together and you have to have actual data backing you up. And because this is a relatively nascent area where we're trying to marry environmental issues with trade, we don't have all of the research at our fingertips. We don't have the mechanisms in place necessarily to drive the transparency that we need to actually do the research. So I think, you know, this is all very, um, this is all very relevant at this moment. So when I think about and look at the fisheries subsidies issues and thinking about the fact that we, 
saw the WTO membership come together for the first time ever and agree on an environmental agreement in 2022 um, after, like I said, decades of you know, lots of very smart people dedicating weeks on end in Geneva and and around the world to to trying to get this done. This is really, truly nothing short of historic. You can say what's in it, what's not in it, and we can have intellectual debates about all of that. But the actual fact that there was consensus among a membership that has been very fractured on an issue that's this important, I think deserves a lot of recognition. Um, and, you know, as I think about what went into that um, and, you know, some of the other agreements like the CPTPP, the um, uh, USMCA and, and what all it takes to reach an agreement, I wanted to offer a few thoughts. So, in order to get to that policy outcome, you need to understand the state of play on global fish stocks, on access agreements, on fleet capacity, on projected production. You need to understand which vessels are fishing where, under what jurisdiction, and what rules apply. You need to understand all of the external factors that are contributing to the status of the fish stocks, including rising sea temperatures and, and other things that have nothing to do with subsidies. Um, then you need input from the lawyers and the trade experts and the trade negotiators. And then you need to talk to the fishery scientists and the fishers themselves and the fishing companies and then the shipbuilders, and then the engine manufacturers and the fuel providers and the local communities and the value and then of course the policy makers, and then the enforcers of the policies. And then on top of all of that, you need to understand for each country involved in whether it's a multilateral negotiation or bilateral or regional, you need to understand the unique perspective of each country in that negotiation. So what is it about fish that's important to them? Is it an export for them? Is it a food security issue for them? Is it a longstanding subsistence or, or artisanal practice that they want to hold on to? Maybe it's all of those, but that's going to drive how countries are thinking about these issues. And Christine, you mentioned India. I mean, politics is ever present in all of this because countries need to think about why fish is important to them and the various constituencies that they have and what each of those constituencies wants to see or not see when it comes to, to an agreement. So, I mean, I just want to lay that out there because I think it's so important to understand how much goes into this. And that really reflects the interdisciplinary approach. When I was working on the negotiations on the uh, on the environment chapter for the U.S. Mexico Canada agreement, which was the update to to the NAFTA agreement, the U.S. position on fisheries, for example, took months of work with ten different U.S. agencies and many many stakeholders to come up with that. It wasn't just you know me sitting there in my office one day being like you know what we should really discipline overfishing and overcapacity. Um, this truly is a whole of government approach and a whole of stakeholder approach. And I think that other countries uh, are, are in a similar, a similar boat. Um, there are so many puns. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, I would say too, that we have the WTO fisheries negotiation that was running in parallel to the negotiations for TPP, which then was eventually signed as the CPTPP, and then of course the USMCA and, and, and TTIP, the US EU negotiations were going on at the same time. So you had these smaller sets of negotiations all talking about fisheries management and marine mammal bycatch and fisheries subsidies at the same time that you had this multilateral negotiation that was, that was going on. 
And I think a lot of people, including myself, felt like if we could reach some ambitious conclusion in some of these smaller agreements, that could really breathe some life into the multilateral discussion and pr provide a blueprint. And we could have lessons learned from, from some of those negotiations. What's going to work? What's not going to work? How are we going to think about developed versus developing countries? I mean, these are all the sorts of issues that, you know, we could see on sort of a micro level and how we're going to deal with it at the multilateral level. So I think that there was a lot of promise in all that. We did end up concluding the USMCA uh, environment chapter. And, you know, I'm proud to say that I think it is the most comprehensive and ambitious set of uh, fisheries disciplines for sure um, in any trade agreement that I am aware of. We often joked that because we had so many pages of commitments, all enforceable um, on fisheries issues in that chapter, that it read more like an FAO agreement than a trade agreement, which I think kind of gets to this other point that we're trying to highlight today, which is that the our grandmother's trade issues of what is the tariff on a widget um, and how do we lower that is not the complexity of trade issues that we're facing today, particularly when you bring in environment. Um, so, you know, in the lead up to this next ministerial conference this week, um, I want to throw out a few things that I'm watching and that I hope others are, are watching too. Um, and and think about what's what's really at stake here. So, you know, in 2022, the WTO membership came to an agreement. And there are some very important disciplines that are in that agreement, um, including um, prohibitions on granting or maintaining fisheries subsidies to vessels or operators. And that's an important piece. Um, that are engaged in illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing or fishing-related activities that support IUU fishing. You would think, this should be so easy. Who would ever want to give a subsidy to a vessel that was engaged in illegal behavior? This should be a no-brainer. This is not a no-brainer, and this is actually quite a complex issue. How you define IUU is really important. And Christine's uh, papers have a lot of excellent observations on, for example, how developing countries might define IUU. And, you know, if you give a small artisanal boat, uh, you know, if, if they're found to be engaged in illegal fishing, a very small infraction that's not necessarily having a major impact on global fish stocks, that and that outsized impact on that vessel or operator versus, you know, a massive vessel that's out there trawling around and hoovering up as many fish as possible. It's not necessarily apples to apples, yet still both IUU. So, I mean, I, I think that this sounds like it might've been easy to achieve. It's actually not. And it's also hard to enforce and requires a lot of transparency by WTO membership in providing the information that's going to allow the world and you know the countries that signed up to this agreement to really see how everybody is enforcing this. There was also a prohibition uh, in this first round on subsidies relating to fishing that on overfished stocks um, and fishing subsidies on fishing on the unregulated high seas. So, you know, this is a really good start. Now, what's at stake, you know, what was left on the cutting room floor um, was subsidies related to overfishing and overcapacity. And if you think that my explanation of why IUU is a hard nut to crack, the subsidies towards overfishing and overcapacity is an even harder nut to crack, which is probably why it wasn't cracked <laughs> before and uh, and and still remains. So, you know, these are the issues that the WTO membership has been grappling with. In December, the chair released a text for the WTO members to be discussing at this upcoming MC 
that tries to reflect the various different approaches that WTO members are taking to this important issue. Um, and so I think that there is going to be a lot of focus on how exactly we can get at this issue of overfishing and overcapacity. I will note that the chair's explanatory note that accompanies the text, and all of this is public, and I encourage you all to read it, talks about a system um, for addressing overfishing and overcapacity that would essentially um, would would essentially sort of set up a an approach of um if you I'm sorry I'm just trying to find my notes here I'm sorry <laughs> if you if if you are a major offender um this would be an outright prohibition if you're some de minimis offender or LDC maybe there's some carve outs there and in any event there would be a structure that would say, here's a prohibition on subsidies that lead to overfishing or overcapacity, but here's a carve out or exemption where if you can show that those subsidies might add capacity to your fishing fleet, um, but you need it in a bin, you already have a sustainability program in place and that this isn't really going to deplete the stocks, that maybe that's okay. I think conceptually, a setup like that makes sense. I think it could be very difficult in, um, to understand whether or not a country is actually meeting that sustainability criteria to qualify for an exemption. Then how do you really know? Does it just become words on paper versus an actual discipline? Um, so I will I will wrap up here by saying, um, you know, MC13 has overfishing and overcapacity on the cutting room floor that needs to be picked up and we need to figure out a plan. The way that this works is if there's not an agreement, comprehensive agreement in four years and the countries decide that they want to call it quits, they can. Um, if they want to keep going, they can. But otherwise, this agreement could sunset. Um, so there's a lot at stake. We also don't even have full ratification of what was already agreed, and we really need countries to come in and deposit their instruments of ratification. Um, there's a lot of advances on transparency as well, which I think is great, but setting up a system to really work on that makes sense. And then just finally, Christine made a really great point, which is leveraging existing agreements, whether it's a regional fisheries management organization, and we've drawn a lot in the WTO text, as well as USMCA and CPTPP on what those RFMOs are doing, bringing them into the mix, using the FTAs that we have already, or any future FTAs to kind of build on a lot of these concepts will be very important. And then I think that there are some low tech options and technical assistance that makes sense to give to developing countries. But why are we not also thinking big? Like what are the, how are we gonna use this new wave of AI and everything else to help in this area? So I think there's so much that we need to think about when it comes to implementing all of this in addition to actually getting it done. <laughs> so I'm gonna stop there. There's just a lot to say. That's amazing. Well, I think that's just mind boggling um, that the fisheries agreement isn't even about fisheries. It's about fisheries subsidies, right? So um, it's not even about the fish. Um, and yeah. also looking at, you know, that you're saying that it's consensus, Sarah, at any, you know, and then that the data Christine has with all the overfishing is from 2017. So um, that also makes it even more urgent. Uh, but Ben, I'm actually going to hand this to you because I was lucky enough to be on a call with Christine last week. So I feel like I have gotten sort of my fill a little bit. Um, and, and also people are approaching their questions. And so uh, go ahead, Ben. Yeah, let me let me jump in. I've got tons of things that I want to ask both of you. Um, Christine, let me actually just pass it back to you first, because I know that there's a question that you took in the Q&A box and said that you wanted to answer live. So why don't I hand over to you, maybe just remind us what the question is and um, then, you know, talk, talk about it. Okay, th thanks, Ben. So Matali says, uh, since you rightly point out that addressing this global issue requires a community approach, would you be aware of any research being done on a prospective beneficiary developing country uh, why they might want to sit out. 
It's not a rhetorical question. Like phasing out coal plants in a country like India also requires conversations and plans for transitions for the, those workers, their communities, et cetera. Um, is there any research done to identify who could be some potential losers within the developing countries that might be harmed here and how could they become cited? So that is a great question. Um, so just first of all, big picture, um, I will just say that um, phasing out or long transition periods for the global, uh, for the fisheries agreement is nothing like it it, um, it was for, um, it's like textiles or something, right? I mean, if you're, I'll just say India, but uh, you probably know more about India than I do, but but, but any country that's a coastal nation, um, I mean, if, if you don't um, get a handle on the on, on your own fishing stocks, um, then I mean, they will be depleted, right? And then you will have nothing, you'll have nothing left within your own um, coastal areas, your economic exclusive zones, right? So then you will be forced to have to go outside of your EEZs. So the sooner that you can uh, tackle this, the better. Um, and really, it's up to countries how they want to compensate the the losers, right? And of course, there will be losers, um, but the losers are not going to be the the community uh, fishers here, right? I mean, they're going to be like the the vessel operators um, and um, and the, the industrial fishers, you know, like like Sarah was talking about. So um, and so, yeah, sure. I mean, they're uh, remember. I mean, over half of uh, fishing on the high seas would not even happen without subsidies, okay? So we are talking about, yeah, a lot, probably less fishing, at least at first, until we figure out how to do it in a way where the fishing is happening in areas that are not overfished or maximally fished, okay? And that's gonna take time, but but there's nothing, and, and Sarah, correct me if I'm wrong, but there's nothing in the agreement that would uh, prohibit a country to compensate the losers of the subsidies, uh, fishery subsidies agreement, you can compensate them however you want. But uh, but the point is that you know the the longer you let this go on, the longer the transition period is, the the greater the depletion of your own stocks, and you, you're not going to have any fish at, at some point, right? So um, it behooves you to um, to do swift implementation. Also, a lot of these um, developing countries or mid middle countries like India uh, keep complaining that it's foreign fishing vessels, large foreign fishing subsidized vessels, like from China and other countries, and European countries to be sure, and maybe US too. But um, but to the extent that um, India uh, economists, experts, analysts, and, and government officials state on the record that, the, um, that they suffer from these large foreign subsidized vessels coming in and overfishing um, their, their waters or areas around their waters, um, you know, this is a tool, the agreement is a tool for them to fight back against that, right? So, um, so if there is, there's really no downside here of any country signing on, they can implement it, you know, um, how they want, but at least it gives them a tool to fight back against foreign entities depleting their own resources. Let me maybe jump, jump in there. We, we've got another uh, interesting question in the Q&A, and I'd like to pose it to, to both of you because you, you're coming from, you know, slightly different perspectives. And uh, the, the question's from Simon, Simon Lester, and he's asked about, uh, uh, you know, do we have a sense of where the disputes are likely to arise uh, under the under the agreement, uh, the, the fishery subsidies agreement? Um, relatively early days, obviously, but are there emerging points of friction uh, where we see that there are likely to be complaints, likely to be procedures, uh, all these sorts of things. Maybe Sarah, do you do you want to go first? You know, from a negotiator's perspective, what what did you see as the potential stress points? And then Christine, I'll turn it back to you uh, for your thoughts as well. Yeah, no, I think it's a great question, and I think, you know, I think it's going to be, frankly, across the board. There's a lot of stress points, yeah. um, but there's also, there's a lot of optimism, but look, I mean, e like I said, even how you enforce what is IUU fishing and, you know, how you are going about giving subsidies to IUU to fisher fishers and, 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 and operators could be a stress point. 
Will that then make, for example, developing countries less uh, likely to want to actually find a vessel to be out of compliance and then be tagged as IUU and then can't get the subsidy. So you can see how a lot of these, a lot of these pieces come up. I think how developing countries are treated and, and Christine mentioned, you know, India is looking for a 25 year phase in or something like that. I mean, look, this is an, this is an issue that needed to be addressed yesterday. Everybody needs to be under the same tent. Everybody needs to be taking on obligations. We can talk about who needs help enforcing them. Um, but I think, you know, everybody, everybody needs to be in this tent. And I don't think that we should have carve outs. I think that overfishing and overcapacity um, is obviously going to be a controversial area as it was not something that was agreed upon before. And I think you're going to see as that, um, you know, as the negotiations go on, that you know various different camps come out as uh, on 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 that issue um i am not you know super optimistic to see you know some conclusion out of mc13 um i think though that hopefully um progress can be made reacting to the chair's text and advancing the the negotiations Thank you, Christine. Let, let me flip it to you. Let, let me turn it into two questions for the price of one. You know, one, one is this this question about disputes. You know, where do we see the frictions arising? And then the second one, which also came up in the Q and A, and, and Sarah just gave her thoughts on it. Um, what do we think the changes might be out of MC thirteen, if any? Well, I, all we've said the, the WTO stuff uh, and exactly, you know, state of play and uh, to Sarah. But um, but in terms of, you know, Simon had a great point, you know, where are the uh, countries and practices, um, you know, everyone's looking to, I mean, Ch China obviously is um, one of the largest subsidizers, as we saw from the data. Um, but, you know, it's not only China. I mean, it's it's also Spain and Portugal and um, and um, I think. Northern European countries um, that I can't remember at this moment, not because um, I have any bias like, toward them or anything. But Holland. Was, there you go. The Netherlands, um, yes. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. You know, and um, and it's it's it, it's not like, you know, we all have to get, it's like Sarah said, we all have to get under the same tent, but you, you guys, we are already in the same tent, right? So the, the long transition periods just make absolutely no sense because all that does is um, it's going to deplete your own EEZs and it's going to force you, you being a country that wants long transition periods, to um, to have to um, work harder and harder on fishing on the high seas, which is not profitable at all. It's not even commercially viable. Over half of it isn't without subsidies. So it's, you know, you talk to fishermen in India, in, um, in South America, even here, um, you know, on the East Coast of, of the US, um, Africa, uh, they're having to work harder and harder and they're catching less and less. It's already happening, right? So um, there is really, it's in no one's interest at all to, for a long transition period. The only, you know, the, the, the slack there is, um, you know, to, to assist in technological solutions um, and bottom up solutions, including coastal communities, indigenous communities on monitoring and enforcement. It doesn't have to be high tech. You know, um, as long as it is effective, right? And that's what I mean. Uh, I think somebody asked um, in the questions, you know, what do you mean by, by um, uh, 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 Adine asked, you know, what do you mean by research? I mean, let's find out what works and what doesn't work. Um, not every single coastal nation is going to be, you know, doing the same implementation mm -hmm. uh, or uh, monitoring and enforcement, but, but we all have to um, know the, the status of the stocks, right? And whether that is an indigenous way that they've been doing for hundreds of years or whether that's you know a new tech way that you know the u.s coast guard is using or whatever or uh, that you can feed in interpol you know i don't know what that is but we need to find out what's effective can i jump on and and on that too because i think this is a really important point and if you look at the environment chapter of usmca you'll notice that it's not just fisheries subsidies provisions we also have a lot of fisheries management provisions mm -hmm where we lay out, you know, what we mean by fisheries management and we come to alignment among the parties as to what that is and what we're each going to do in that regard and how we could help each other. 
And I think it's super important because you can't, the, the fishery subsidies disciplines alone don't cut it. You also actually have to have each country with strong fisheries management and enforcement provisions on the books that they are enforcing. Otherwise, like one doesn't work without, without the other. Um, and the other thing I would say is going back to Simon's questions just really quickly, um, transparency again, seems like that would be kind of this no brainer thing, like submit your subsidies notifications. That will be a pain point. I guarantee it. It's been a pain point in all other WTO agreements where, you know, at least coming from a U.S. perspective, um, you know, we would look at what notifications other countries and won't name names, but, you know, for example, China, <laughs> we're putting in and we were saying, no way, that's not, you know, that's not comprehensive. And then the U.S. would have to put in a counter notification of, well, what about all of these subsidies that weren't listed there? So mark my words, that will be an area where a lot of battles are fought for fishery subsidies as well. Hannah, do you do you want to come in? I've asked a couple of questions. Do you, do you have one you'd like to finish this off with? Uh, yeah, we're running out of time because we always, always, always do, right? So um, for me, I would just like to wrap it up the way that, um, so that we can run with this. I mean, what we're seeing is that this is something that is extremely important and urgent, and it's um, an issue that however we try to solve this, we can use it for other things. So uh, for both of them, I would like the question that I always ask, like, what is the main takeaway for policymakers? I think we got it in terms of India, right? So step in and do it. It's not about, you, you're you the one who's losing out on not doing it, right? But uh, just one sentence for policymakers and then where uh, those researchers that are on the call now who are you know looking to uh, find something good to do with their PhD thesis or um, postdoc or whatever, right? Where would they, um, what's something that they can dive into that would really make it have an impact on trade policy and on the world. So Christine, why don't you go first? So I think um, the the fisheries access agreements are is an area where we need more work. Um, the um, so Andrew on uh, the uh, Garrett Brown was a, a great colleague of mine who really has kept this entire project going. <laughs> um, and special shout out to Eileen Norcross who believed in it from the beginning when very few other people did. But um, but uh, Garrett will post Andrew Johnson's piece, uh, and he also posted the the link to our entire page of issue briefs. But Andrew Johnson talks a lot about fisheries access agreements and how um, some most of them are not transparent, but to the extent we uh, there, you can get more information about these access agreements. Um, you know what happens when um, access agreements become transparent. You know what happens to the uh, the reported fish stocks. What happens when access agreements are signed with particular countries? Um, the um, you know what are the uh, re reports of um, of overfishing and how is that reported? We have um, an interesting Africa-China story that I can tell you more about offline. Uh, I'm running out of room here, but uh, but it needed some interesting um, new new um, open source research techniques to to learn more about that. Um, uh, but then also teaming up with researchers who do like geospatial monitoring of, of vessels um, and um, you know, you're going to have to team up with people who who are much more um, on the tech side of, of monitoring uh, this type of data because it's not data you can just download from the World Bank. But uh, but the U.S. Coast Guard, um, international organizations, they are um, and just satellite re, uh, related uh, entities who uh, who do open source reporting of this information. Um, I think there's a lot more that economists need to dive in there. Uh, to, to, to use um, and, and mine for information. We're just gonna have to get a lot more creative about, about understanding this different new techniques, new ways, because the, uh, the standard economic empirical analysis ways won't really apply here yet. I'll make That's great, favorite. thank you. Yes, I was just gonna give it to you, Sarah. Um, you know, use data, 
to drive policy outcomes and show benefits for all, because the best way to try to move the needle for some of these countries is to show exactly how Christine has been pointing out throughout this discussion, why being part of the solution and being, you know, a, 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 a contributing member to this agreement can actually have helpful outcomes for everybody. So I'll leave it, I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much. Fantastic. That's Thank you amazing. so much uh, to, to you both. I think we really ended on a great note there. I mean, for, for me, it was just fascinating to have this insight into kind of, uh, you know, research on the one side and then a very practical kind of coalface view of how all of that flows into policy and negotiations. And I think that's that's really priceless. Um, we get a lot of people at different stages of their uh, careers in our audiences. Uh, some are going to go the research track, some are going to go the policy track. And I think there was uh, a little bit of something in there for everyone um, that we get. So really, thank you very much, uh, Christine, for a great presentation. And thank you, Sarah, uh, for great comments. And thank you to you both uh, for uh, great discussions. Um, that, that, was, that was really a pleasure. And I'm glad we got to dive into that issue, if I can play on Christine's, uh, I, I think, unintentional uh, uh, pun in that, uh, in that last section. Um, so Hannah, as usual, thanks to you uh, for a great session. Let me remind everyone uh, that we have a webinar next month as well. It's on March 21st, as usual, at 9 a.m. Uh, Eastern time. Uh, change in pace. We've got a couple of gravity model uh, researchers coming. Um, so it'll be, uh, it'll be economist heavy, um, but they've promised that they'll keep it accessible and intuitive. Um, so we're going to be talking about uh, something I'm actually really personally interested in, which is uh, mixing gravity modeling with causal inference. Um, so if you're coming from a background where you're used to seeing everything done in terms of causal identification, treatment effects, uh, all these sorts of things, um, this is a really interesting paper that tries to marry that uh, with the standard gravity model that uh, you, you know people like me use most most days of the week. Um, so if you're interested in that, please do come along and join us. Again, thank you to uh, my colleague, Hannah. Um, it, it's, a, it's a team effort. Um, thank you to both of our speakers and thank you to everyone who's joined us uh, in the audience today. Yes, and just for those of you who might, you know, now be scared with your notes to get everything, everything will be posted on the website. Um, the, the presentations and the recordings are all there and we will continue this conversation in the LinkedIn group. So if you haven't joined the LinkedIn group, just hop on and we'll let you in. There's about 3,000 people in there. And so, for example, Gareth, so that we get all those beautiful links again, that would be awesome. Uh, so thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen, uh, for coming in, for being here. As always, I am so, we're so lucky to get to do this, right, Ben? We're so lazy. Absolutely. We just get the most amazing people come in to talk to us. Uh, and we just get to learn everything in an hour. I love it. I know that was that 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 was really great fun. So th thanks to everyone and all the best for the rest of your day. Yes, thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.